Um, this is Anne Marie Bro from EBSCO for folks that don't know me. Um, we have sprint review today. Um, we have uh, a handful of demonstrations, um, not as many as usual, I think because uh, lots of, of teams are um, in the process of fixing bugs and preparing things for release. Um, I imagine at the next demo, four weeks from now, we, we may have um, more demonstrations of features that um, have been completed in the past week or are in the process of being completed right now. Um, before this meeting, Kalila and I met to make a couple changes in uh, what, what we do with the slide deck that goes with the meeting and a little bit of the format. So I just wanna run through that really quickly. Um, we have the two slides that show the various teams and what modules they work on. The names of the teams that have pages on the Folio Wiki are hot links now so that you can get to um, more details about the teams, um, who's on what team and uh, who the leads are, who the product owner is, the scrum master, all of that kind of information. So we've pulled out the team slides that showed the names of all of the team members. There's also a link to the team module responsibility matrix, which becomes very important around this time in the um, release cycles. Um, that's where you'll find kind of the owners of each of the various UI and backend modules that make up Folio and uh, which team is responsible for um, uh, getting those releases out for the new, uh, the new flower release. So the team membership details you can get to from this link and then there's um, uh, pages for each of the various teams. And again, here's the responsibility matrix. In terms of timelines, we have two big things happening right now in the current sprint. Um, as for Iris, the hotfixes for Hotfix 1 were released uh, a couple of weeks ago. Hotfix 2, the plans are that it will be released on the 28th of June. Um, the hotfixes need to be approved and checked. Um, approved, released, and tested in the um, uh, bug fest environment by the end of the current sprint. And then that will give a, about a week to get them integrated into the IRIS uh, release. At the same time, all the teams are trying to get ready for their Juniper releases. And again, all of the Juniper releases are due by the end of this sprint. Um, so the timelines for the Juniper releases are at this link and the timeline for the Kiwi release, which is still draft, but it's getting closer to finalized is at this other link. And then the last thing I think, yes, the last thing that we've done is we are <clears throat> making a, an area under each particular flower release where we will link the recordings for the sprint demos that belong to that release. So we've started that with Juniper and you'll see um, at the link on your screen that we've started a page for the Juniper sprint demos within the whole Juniper wiki area. And as the sprint demos happen, we'll add the recording links there. And that way for um, libraries or for developers that are interested in understanding the work that's been done during a particular release cycle, they'll be able to see the, those details um, in the same area that they're seeing the release notes and the calendar and such. So any questions about that or Kalila, anything you wanna to add to that? Hey everyone, no, nothing to add. Thanks Anne-Marie for moving forward with this and thanks Owen for uh, giving uh, some of the original suggestions for, for some of these changes. Yes, definitely. 
All right. So no slides of names, um, but there have been some changes on various teams, especially in the last couple of weeks. Um, so if you have interest in particular teams, check out their, their uh, wiki pages. Um, we have our regular highlights for the various development teams. Um, and they are available in the slide deck. Is that somebody else wanting to talk? <clears throat> okay, if you don't want to talk, please mute yourself. And in a moment, we will get to ta da, the demos. And so we have five teams uh, doing demos today. And I am going to stop sharing and turn things over to Owen. Hi, hopefully you can hear me. And yes, if I share, you can see folio on my yes. desktop. Uh, okay. What I want to show today is the new dashboard that we've been working on for the ERM team. The initial release of this will be in Juniper. And although it's come out the ERM development and the focus for this release is ERM functionality, um, it's designed to be extensible to any module that wanted to expose information uh, on the dashboard. And I'll, you'll see what I'm talking about when I talk about the dashboard in a moment. Um, so I'm going to just log in as a member of EMRM staff. Um, so what we found in ERM that we were getting requests for people to be able to easily see kind of information at a glance that was relevant to them about their um, various aspects of electronic resource management. Um, we deal with uh, licenses for electronic resources, for agreements that group content under licenses and link them to purchase order lines if necessary. And also for some users, um, jobs that load data into the agreements application. So we have been working on a dashboard that allows the user to display key information from whichever of those apps they would like but also that it's personalized to them. So it's not a generic view of the data and that they can configure that in a way that, that matches their requirements, not just uh, generic requirements that might fit one person or one institution, but not everybody. So that led to the development of the dashboard app, which is now in the top of the, uh, the navigation. So it's a new app. Um, the, uh, so this is the dashboard and this is my personal dashboard as this user. It's currently empty. Um, and I can add what I, what I call, it's essentially a canvas for me to drop on what we call widgets, which are kind of encapsulations of data from other applications. So um, if I go to add a new widget to my display, I can decide what that widget's gonna be called. So in this case, let's say, I want to see a list of licenses um, that are relevant to me. Um, licenses can have um, various staff members associated with them. So um, I'm gonna um, look for licenses that are associated with me um, as a user. So I can see the ones that have been allocated to me. Um, when I choose, uh, you can see we've got three, what we call widget definitions at the moment. And that list, um, we'd expect to get longer as we see more support for different types of widget or widgets from different applications. Um, at the moment, we've got one kind of underlying type, which is uh, a, uh, a widget that knows how to talk to agreements and licenses uh, and the APIs, the interfaces they support. But, um, uh, and then we have three kind of specializations of that, one that knows how to talk to agreements, agreement jobs and licenses. But um, those widget types that we're seeing here or the widget definitions we're seeing here are registered by the individual applications themselves to the dashboard. So 
if we hadn't installed agreements, we wouldn't see those two widgets there because they're they're um, registered by the agreements app, um, not by they're not hard coded into the dashboard in some way. Um, so I've got various options on this screen now. I've chosen to do a, 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 a licenses widget. I'm going to add a filter, which allows me to uh, set some search criteria, essentially. So in this case, I'm going to say the internal contact for the license is me. So that's going to pick up my UUID, my user UUID. And um, I can decide how many rows I display in sort order. And um, I can add what columns I want to see in that final display. So let's say I want to see um, a couple of pieces of information about licenses. Um, I'll put the end date in there as well. Uh, and when I save this, we'll be returned to the dashboard. And we'll see this is the one license that is owned by the ERM staff user. And so that's coming through from licenses. If we look at the licenses app, we can see there are a couple of licenses there, but it's only finding this one because um, I'm named as an internal contact there, or the ERM staff user is named as the internal contact there uh, and not on this one. There's no internal contact there. So I can start adding to my dashboard. Um, so I can do another one. Um, so in this case, one of the common requirements was agreements or licenses that were expiring um, in, in a, a kind of limited time period. So ones that are coming up for expiry. Um, agreements and licenses can have end dates. And so ones that are reaching their end date might need something doing to them, either renewing or renegotiating, or um, it might have an impact on the, the content that you have access to, et cetera. So, um, So this one is going to draw from the um, ERM widgets, uh, ERM agreements, and um, I'm going to add a filter in this case that is by end date. So when we have uh, date filters, we have some options to do dates relative to today. So if I say um, we want to find, uh, let's say, uh, agreements that expire within a month of today, we can say the end date is on or before uh, one month after today. So essentially, uh, we're looking for ones that expire before the end of this or before the, the next month is out. So a month from today. Um, and again, I can add the appropriate um, data to this. Uh, so let's uh, include the end date and status. Um, and I can um, add multiple rules in my filters. So um, this would find all the ones expiring before a month's time, but I might want to rule out those that have an end date. Um, oh, I need to do an and for that. So, uh, so and the end date is on or after um, let's say today. So I don't find ones that have expired in the past, basically. So that finds um, me one agreement in this case, and that uh, expires in uh, at the end of this month. So that's why it's been found. It expires within a month. And you can see here that we can also um, link through to this agreement. So this agreement is a live link and that links to that agreement in the agreements app. Um, and just to show some other functionality, um, agreements would normally have agreement lines. So um, uh, one of the things that people wanted to see is, is um, ones without agreement lines. Um, so uh, the we're, we're working on that we've got a, an outstanding tweak here to change the, the language here, but essentially uh, where the agreement lines list is empty, uh, this is saying, and 
I could just include the name in this case. And we can see there are a few that are lacking agreement lines. Um, and I'll just uh, log out as the um, and log back in as the ERM manager. So this is logging in as a different user just to demonstrate that if I can get the password right. This dashboard, is, since I'm a different user, I get a complete different dashboard. I'm not, uh, shit, this is not a generic view. Um, so I can do things like, so in this case, I want to find um, agreements with a tag, which is urgent and um, a status which is in negotiation oh something wrong there um, and you're using the tags filter yeah so um so one of the we are one of the shortcomings at the moment is that's just text entry so we're not picking up um the tag values um you have to enter the right text but yes that that finds so in this case this is an agreement that's in negotiation tagged as urgent so if i look i can see that's tagged as urgent there uh, it's the um and um and it's in a negotiation so i can use this to start to kind of build some um some kind of way of managing my work if i want to um and, so you're I'm sorry, sorry. keep going um so i just will show one more thing and then i can see there's a question in the chat and you have some more questions Anne marie um so i wanted to show um uh just um agreement jobs and just to show this one working. And in this case, um, we can, so if we look at this one, this one finds um, 14 results. Um, so here it always shows you the number it's found. Um, and here we have the number of rows to display. The point of the dashboard isn't to display hundreds and hundreds of rows of results, but give kind of an overview. So we've defaulted that to 10, but the user can adjust that down or up. So if I just want um, the five latest jobs, let's say that um, uh, that have a, a failure uh, or, well, actually that were not successful, then we can kind of narrow that down. And again, you can see this link through to the job. Um, something I didn't point out before is that there's a link to app here. If I look at the, uh, that's this URL link. Eventually we hope to be able to support a link directly to the same search results as the filter is showing, because then you could go from say 14 results to only displaying say five of 14 results to seeing the full results in the application. We're not there yet with that, but we've got this link. So you can link through to the full app to see um, to see your jobs if you need to, but it's not, um, it's just a convenience link really um, at the moment. Uh, that could be obviously changed, but the URL link is editable by the user. So they could link to something else if they wanted to have a handy link here that went somewhere else. Um, and finally, the you can change the order of these. So you can decide which order your dashboard is displaying in. Um, that's entirely down to you as well. I'll stop there. That's probably enough demo. Um, so this is, I think, the first user level um, customization of Folio that that persists across sessions. Does uh, does that sound right? 
I, as far as I remember, pretty much everything is at the tenant level as far as settings and things. Um, but very cool. And there's a question in chat and sort of my question too, if, if other teams are interested, is there um, documentation on how to uh, create some, a widget that would show up in that widget definition area? Yeah, so um, the, uh, the, the question, can I expand a little on how it can be used with other apps? So um, first of all, I'll point to the documentation, um, but I think that this needs some updating. Um, I think Ethan, who's done the vast majority of the development on this, is on the call and might be able to say a bit more. But the there's documentation on the wiki, um, which um, which start which works through the the data model and how this is actually managed. Um, we essentially have what we call a widget type, which is essentially a, um, knows how to uh, knows about a certain type of interface and how to display data. Um, the definition kind of points at configures that then. So what we've got at the moment is one widget type, which is which knows how to talk to the uh, the APIs we support, which are common across agreements, licenses, and the agreement jobs. Uh, um, because it, uh, and then the definition tells it this is the endpoint that you want to look at, and these are the fields that are available as a result of that endpoint, and this is a path in the JSON where you find that. Um, uh, where you find those fields or properties. Um, and the if we if to to extend this to other apps, um, we would need to kind of find what what the types of widget we wanted to do. all ours at the moment are these kind of basically search apps. We'd like to do some different types of apps um, in another iteration which might be things like one of the things we've talked about is a traffic light app, which might just be looking for a kind of red, amber, green status for a particular service or a particular thing. So with the job process that we run, maybe something that, that kind of just gives you a status of the latest job as a very you know, singular kind of re response rather than a search for all the jobs that have failed, which is what we have at the moment. But um, we could have different types and then if we have kind of common types, we could say um, configure them at the widget definition level. That that's what kind of differentiates uh, widgets with a common type. And then what the user configures is what we call a widget instance, so an instantiation of the widget um, for their dashboard. Um, hopefully that made some kind of sense, but the documentation is there. Um, there's also some stuff, some clever stuff behind the scenes happening to um to do things like know how to link to a job if it displays a job uuid is something that uh, we're storing in a registry which the dashboard maintains but is being registered by the external apps so um to give another example of that i think this is um this is an example um I think uh, Ethan can jump in if I'm wrong, um, is that we can have a filter which does, we can filter by a specific agreement. So you could actually use it to kind of pin an agreement to your dashboard by saying, and knowing that agreements are things you can search for and that this is the search plugin to use for agreements is something that's that's stored in the registry, I believe. Yeah. Um, oh, that's e there's Ethan. Um, so, so the, the reasoning behind that is that um, the, the reason for doing something like that where agreements has to register, stuff like that, is that this form is completely dynamic. So in theory, once the work's been done on our end to support a particular widget type, that form should suffice for whatever shape of widget definition your developers can write. And um, the other thing I was going to say was, oh, there was another question in the chat. Oh, about refreshing. So the um, you can see at the bottom of each widget, there's a last refresh time. So this is the, the last refresh time. And I can refresh the results in this widget by um, clicking that refresh arrow. But it, um, Ethan, does it refresh? 
when you uh, regularly anyway i believe so yes uh, i would need to check but i i do believe so and it's oh. done per widget not it yeah if you want to refresh the whole dashboard you can refresh the page but you can refresh on a widget by widget basis nice so um we've dropped a link to the documentation in chat and i have a feeling this may start to result in some uh, features showing up in in various other teams because it's very cool i can see it being really useful okay and yeah drop ethan or i questions you can ask me if you want to know about the functionality we're trying to enable and if you, you can ask ethan if you've got technical questions um so uh we're both on the erm developers channel so awesome thank you and maybe if it um if it starts to be something that's um kind of across teams we may want to think about setting up a dashboard um slack channel where conversations should be had that extend beyond ERM. All right. Thank you so much, Owen. Um, so next up is Spitfire with Kalila and the first Dennis B of the day. Um, yes. Um, so hey, guys, again. Um, so Dennis B, or Bodan, uh, will uh, demonstrate some of the work we've uh, done in, in the last two sprints. Um, he will show what we did in the eHoldings app in regards to uh, uh, displaying a keyboard shortcut modal. And then uh, he'll uh, showcase uh, what we've done uh, to show notes as a pop-up when you're on a user record or if you are, uh, are in the, or, or it pops up as a, a, a no, uh, there's a note pop up on the checkout app. That's what I'm trying to say. So Dennis is going to show that and probably uh, demonstrate a lot better than what I just tried to present. So um, Dennis, take it away. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Thank you, Kalila. Um, I hope you can hear me, right? Yes. Yes, Dennis. Okay. Great. Um, so let me share my screen. Um, that's this one, I think. Mm, okay, yeah, so as Kalila said, uh, first I'm going to sh show you what we've done uh, in Holdings application. So we have um, added uh, to this uh, up context menu an option to see keyboard shortcuts uh, for the Holdings application. So you can see that. Um, a user now has the ability to view what kind of shortcuts uh, are available to them and uh, yeah, see how they can be used and uh, what those shortcuts will do. Um, yeah, so I think uh, that's probably all regarding this uh, functionality. And now I'm going to switch to um, user's application and then what we've done uh, to display uh, notes as pop-ups. Um, so if I pick some user and and go and uh, add a note, that's this one already has a note. Um, okay, yeah, let's pick this one and uh, create a new note um, called something like. Um, Just pop up note and uh, add some data. Mm. Yeah, something like this. So now you can see uh, that we have um, added two more fields to uh, this form um, to display a note as a pop up on um, either checkout application or user's application or both. Um, so I'm going to uh, pick both and uh, click save and close. Um, and uh, at the moment, uh, you have to switch to another user and go back, but uh, we're, we're, we have changed it, uh, but it, it hasn't been applied to a, a snapshot environment yet. Um, yeah, so you can see that uh, when you um, view user details page, you can see that uh, a note appears 
and it shows uh, this data. Um, and you have two options to either close the node or delete it. Uh, if you close the node, then um, you will be able to view it again. Um, the next time you uh, you view this uh, user details page, or you can click delete note and uh, the note will be deleted, but I'm not going to do that now because I want to show you um, how it works in checkout application as well. So I've uh, copied this user's barcode and now if I um, go to checkout, checkout application and enter the barcode, uh, I will also see this note pop up. Um, so that's the same note for the same user. Now, if I um, click delete note and um, let's refresh the page. And uh, scan this again. Uh, yeah, so the note has been deleted and uh, it uh, will not appear again. Um, yeah, and uh, I think that's all I wanted to show you. Um, so if if you have any questions regarding this, um, then I'll I'll be happy to answer. The second really cool thing of the day. Um, one question that occurred to me is when when the note pops up and you have the choice to dismiss it or delete it, um, is there a separate permission related to deleting, or um, if you have permission to work with notes, you can dismiss yeah. or delete? Yeah, so um, if you have permission to edit or delete notes, then you'll be able to do this again. So we haven't uh, added any new permissions for that. Okay. So very cool. Okay. Any other Thank questions? Mm -hmm. All right, well, you know where to find him. <laughs> okay, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. And now our second Dennis B of the day with Thunderjet um, acquisitions and a couple demos from Makita and Andre. Thanks very much, Henry. And there's this requires no introduction. <laughs> it's going to be that amazing. Uh, so I won't say much here. I'm just going to let Makita take over and walk us through a few exciting things. Uh, yeah, thank you, Dennis, and uh, I hope you can see my screen and hear me well. Yes. Um, and uh, there are three things uh, I'd like to talk about uh, today, uh, like um, printing actions for orders and uh, invoices, um, invoice line and PL line relink, and uh, some search improvements for orders and order lines. And let's, uh, let's start from uh, print actions. So we implemented uh, for orders and order lines uh, print actions action. Uh, and by clicking it, um, we generate a kind of a page that can be uh, saved as PDF or printed via real print. Uh, and on this uh, page, we display, like we combine uh, information from both order and uh, order lines, um, some info from order uh, at the top of this page and uh, all uh, linked to this order uh, lines uh, in the table. And it looks uh, pretty similar to multi-column list uh, that we use uh, across Folio application. And yeah, as I mentioned, uh, this action can be used uh, from both uh, order details or order lines. Uh, and uh, one more print action that's available uh, for uh, approved or paid invoices. Uh, it's print voucher. Um, it's the same, like uh, standard in uh, print browser window. And here we display combination of uh, uh, invoice uh, and voucher information. And yeah, the same, it can be uh, printed or saved uh, as a PDF. And uh, that's it uh, for print actions. 
And let's move to another feature. Uh, it's relink uh, peer line in invoice line. So there are two, uh, actually mostly two scenarios here. Uh, the first one when uh, user imported uh, invoice uh, and invoice line uh, via data import. And in this case, uh, invoice uh, has source EDI. Uh, and uh, notice that something is wrong with uh, invoice line. For example, um, there is no match uh, match to peer line or peer line is incorrect. Uh, in my case, uh, nothing is matched and peer line number uh, is empty and uh, additional informa uh, information related to peer line as well. And when we go to edit uh, invoice line, now we have peer line number field and uh, peer line lookup. Uh, and here we can select uh, peer line. And in case it's existing uh, invoice line and source is EDI, we update on the description, uh, peer line reference and uh, fund distributions. Uh, all of other fields, um, uh, we keep the same. And uh, yeah, we can save this invoice line and everything is updated. Uh, and the second scenario, in case we worked with uh, non-EDI um, invoice, or we want to add a uh, new invoice line to, to existing uh, invoice, it can be EDI or non-EDI, it doesn't matter. And we can uh, use peer line lookup uh, in this case to, to just fill uh, all information uh, for invoice line and just save. Uh, like in this case, it works uh, similar to uh, add action, uh, but uh, um, we allow user to override some fields manually. Uh, yeah, and um, in case uh, invoice is approved, um, canceled, or paid, it's not possible to change peer line difference. It's available only for uh, opened or reviewed invoices. And I think that's it with uh, relink feature. And uh, the last thing uh, I'd like to mention, uh, to mention that um, our team made some uh, improvements for order and order lines uh, search. Uh, we migrated from um, views to cross indexes and uh, search uh, on the screens, like orders and uh, order lines should be better. Uh, and this is from my part, thank you. So Dennis and I happened on the um, uh, search for the PO and uh, PO line and link to the invoice when we were doing some edifact testing last week. And this is one of the last pieces of the puzzle for um, when we deliver Edifact invoices and they're imported, um, uh, especially for ongoing orders where you may not have your um, match set up quite right yet for your purchase order line to your invoice line, um, it's wonderful to be able to link to the correct purchase order line meal. So that's one of the, the last key pieces to get in place for importing electronic invoices. So it's great to see. Okay, I want to proceed our demo. Hope uh, you can see my screen. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to demonstrate uh, the part of features that we are currently working on, uh, all um, progress that we made uh, uh, on our rancher environment, uh, it's uh, R3 feature, so, but uh, we have uh, made uh, some progress and we want to demonstrate what we have. Uh, so uh, the changes that I'm going to demonstrate is about um, changing locations, uh, selecting uh, holdings, uh, receive uh, pieces and um, changing quantities and uh, how we connect it with uh, 
uh, inventory application. Mm, so let's uh, see how it's work. Uh, I prepared uh, push solder with the pending status with uh, one P line. And if we are going to it details and edit screen. Uh, here's two conditions uh, when uh, the title is connected to the instance or not. So if uh, no connections like uh, here we have, uh, there is no changes. Uh, user need to specify locations. And if we want to connect our title to inventory instance, let's do it. And here we can see that it's connected. And uh, now user need to uh, specif specify a location, uh, holding location. Here we can see in drop-down list uh, that uh, our instance connected uh, to, to holdings and we can select one of them and uh, the next one, uh, specify quantity. And uh, if user want uh, to create new holding, so we need to select any location that we can do and add it. So um, now uh, the label is set. Uh, its uh, location and the user can uh, remove it or save as is. So now we can save it. And check the details. Uh, here we can see as that we specify uh, two holdings and uh, one uh, location. If we open our order, Uh, the holding for our location uh, should be created. And we can check it here. So yes, uh, here we can see three holdings now. And if we are going to edit form, we'll see that uh, a new warning banner appears. And it says that uh, this order has received records and uh, the quantities cannot be edited. It's uh, possible only in uh, receiving now, but uh, as I mentioned, this feature is in progress. So I believe we will demonstrate this part of feature in the next demo. So, um, and one of the things that I want to demonstrate is connection between uh, our orders and inventory application. So if we are going, uh, we'll see. Mm. Uh, three holdings, two that uh, it has, this instance uh, has previously, and one that was created uh, during opening our order. And if we are going to you, uh, under acquisition cardon, we'll see the connection between our PO line and uh, our holding. So it's uh, we can navigate to our PO line by clicking on PO line number. And uh, one more thing, if we are going to another holding, we'll see. Um, all PL lines that's connecting with these holdings and uh, all statuses. And if uh, status is closed, uh, we'll see also uh, the reason of closing. And I think that's it from my side. Thank you. Really nice, Andre. And um, we're starting to get all those connections in place between orders and inventory and also being able to change the location gives you a way to, for libraries that use a kind of generic ordering location to be able to update that to the permanent location once the material is received. So that looks really nice. And I, I just want to mention 
just to be clear about this, uh, like Andre sort of mentioned this as well, that we've been working on this. It was planned for R2 and it was developed sort of on its own branch uh, because of all the constraints of, of R2 and the uncertainty that we might get this finished. It's not the kind of feature that makes sense to split apart because it affects so much of the different logic involved with receiving. Uh, so that's why we're we're doing the demo today from the rancher environment, and we we made the decision basically because there wasn't enough time to release this in R2 to hold this over so we can properly test it and release it in R3. So wanted to show a portion of that now, but you won't see this in the testing or the snapshot environments uh, because the code is still still being worked on on its own branch. Uh, thanks so much, Andre. And good to know. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. All right. Now, Vega, Anna. Hello, everyone. I'm sharing my screen. Um, you can see the screen now, yes. right? Yes. Uh, so I'm going to demo uh, cache drawer reconciliation report. Uh, we have been working last uh, sprints. And uh, uh, this report uh, uh, is used by staff members who have been assigned a register to cash out uh, their register drawer at the end of their shift. So um, at, at the beginning, we need to uh, fill data um, for formatting this report. Uh, we need to select uh, the date, start date, and end date for um, report uh, date ranges. We should choose service point and sources for uh, already chosen service point. And here we uh, have a possibility to choose report format. Uh, this is uh, CSV or PDF or uh, both reports. Mm. So let's um, save both reports. The first one already opened in PDF uh, format. They are pretty similar. So at the top of report, we can see the title, uh, which um, contains the service point for current um, report and sources. Here is administrator Tiku and the date ranges. Uh, the first on the top, we can see the main report and uh, below, the uh, below this table are produced the report totals of uh, source, payment method, uh, fifine type and uh, fifine owner. So this is PDF. Uh, format and um, let's see to the CSV report. Uh, it's pretty similar. We have the same um, main table at the top of report. Um, below uh, this table, we can see the header with uh, necessary information for staff and the report totals for source payment method, fine type and owner. Um, the only difference uh, in this report is uh, that it contains one extra field, uh, which is link. And uh, we can navigate to uh, find details page for um, selected fine. Um, if we select uh, dates, let's say from 1st of June to 2nd, and in this date ranges, no, there is no any uh, fees and fines um, were created, then we will see this red message that no items found. 
Um, that's all I've got. Thank you for your attention. If you have any questions, please ask. Thanks I stop very, sharing. Thanks very much, Anna. Thanks. Continuing the money theme from Thunderjet. All right, and Roman. Yeah, hi. I'm sharing my screen. Can you see it? Yes. Uh, you should see the calendar, right? Yes. Okay. So uh, my feature that I wanted to demo is uh, some piece of truncated due date feature uh, if the pattern expiration date is earlier than initial due date. Uh, I've already set up a calendar. Uh, the library works today, uh, tomorrow, and it is closed uh, on Thursday and open on Friday. Also, I've created a user uh, which expires uh, on June 10th. And also I configured a loan policy uh, with two days uh, loan period and uh, moved to the end of the previous open day uh, closed library due date management strategy. Uh, it means that initial loan due date uh, should be on June 10th, but since this is uh, a pattern expiration date, the due date should be truncated to the end of the last open day uh, before pattern expiration. Uh, the last open day is June 9th, uh, so let's check uh, that uh, everything works as expected. I will check out uh, a book for, for this pattern. Uh, and now we can see that the due date is June uh, 10th, but uh, seems like something went wrong. Actually, I expected to see uh, June 9th, but maybe someone has changed it. Let me check. Uh, Yeah, uh, the rule was a bit changed. The circulation rule was a bit changed. Uh, so let me let me fix it. Uh, now the rule for book should be faculty. Uh, pattern group should be faculty and uh, material type should be book. Okay, let me uh, let me check another one. Uh, pattern expiration, uh, closed library due date management. I will change, uh, will change it to the end of the next open day. And now let's check the result. Oh, now it, it works correct. Uh, so we can see uh, 
9th of June uh, the due date uh, because uh, if uh, the due date if it wasn't uh, truncated uh, the due date should be uh, the end of the next open day but uh, the pattern expires earlier and uh, it was truncated to the 9th uh, to the June 9th so for this case it works okay but I will uh, check later what happened with uh, the first one that's probably it. Thanks. All right. That looks good, Roman. Thank you. And Alex. Hi, everyone. Uh, let me share my screen. Can you see it? Yes. UPCs. Okay. Cool. So uh, we were approached by our support and ops team with the request to implement support for custom email headers. Uh, for those unfamiliar, email headers are basically these additional lines of text attached to every email message. Um, they're uh, key value pairs, which allow you to pass additional data without exposing it to the um, email body. And, um, and guys from support team had a very specific uh, use case in mind for this feature. They needed it um, to enable a more verbose logging for AWS mail server, which is the one we use to send emails around. So uh, these email headers are configured through Folio's API and um, all you need to do to create a custom header is just to create um, a new a configuration entry in mod config. Uh, in mod config. Um, so this is the whole entry. Um, these two properties are mandatory. Uh, you have to use this um, specific values for module and config name. Um, these two keys are used uh, by Folio to identify this configuration entry as a custom header. And these two are um, arbitrary. This is your uh, custom header name and this is the value. So once I create this new configuration, this new custom header will be added to every single email message uh, sent by Folio. So I'm going to show you where you can find those uh, so I will send a very basic email message to myself. We should see it shortly. Yeah, there it is. So if you take the list of headers of this message, yeah, as you can see, it's a pretty long list. And I hope you can see because the, the text is pretty small and blurry. And yeah, there it is. This is the custom header we just created. So as I said, once you, you, you configure this uh, custom header, it is added to every email message and you can configure as many um, headers as you want, as long as they have uh, different values of this code property. And this is it, thank you. And so the, the purpose of that, you said, was for some of the AWS logging, was that it? Um, well, actually, you can use these headers for many purposes, but um, the specific use case why um, support team has requested this feature is um, uh, it provides them the ability to enable this yeah, more verbose uh, logging for uh, emails, which is very helpful for troubleshooting. Yes, I know the emails go astray sometimes and it's hard to trace back. So yes, yeah. it seems very helpful. Yeah, thank you. Okay, and last but certainly not least is Falcon and Pavel. Well, I will share my screen now. Let me know if you can see it. Yes. Yes, I will present only one story. It's about ordering of the facets. Uh, previously, we faced with a problem that if a user selects uh, one of the facets of the bottom of the list, 
for example, it will be Romanian Moldovan. It won't be able to see it in the list. We fixed it, and for now, a user can check the new facets, and will, they will appear at the top of the list in the sorting order as way before. If user uncheck the facet, it will go to the place where it in. So that's me from my side. Thank you. Oh my goodness, too short and sweet. Yeah. Um, is yeah. Magda, yes. Ma are you on Magda? Yes, I am. Um, okay. Can you, could I ask for the um, release that's coming up for Juniper, will, will there be the inventory and the inventory ES like we see in snapshot and snapshot load? I don't think there was a conversation about that. Uh, I believe it will stay as it is. So you, you would see both of them or we would be, uh, libraries would have probably be implementing both of them. Is that right? I'm not sure, Anne-Marie, this is uh, the place we, we should discuss this. I don't think okay. uh, there was any decision about removing this from Folio um, complete. Uh, we can talk about this later. Okay. All right, so I'm gonna uh, pop my screen back up just for a minute. Uh, where is my, oh, it's behind the bar. That's why I can't get to it. Okay, so we have um, two more uh, hectic sprints coming up. Um, the current sprint is um, all pretty much all of the Juniper release tasks, um, the last bits of schema upgrade testing, and um, also the release of the Iris Hotfix 2 um, pieces. So um, 116 is gonna be very uh, hectic. Sprint 117 is uh, just confirming the uh, hotfixes that have been released for Iris and getting ready for bug fest. So getting all the test rail tests created or updated on the part of the product owners and getting um, all of the modules released, getting um, uh, the Juniper uh, bug, bug fest environment upgraded from Iris to Juniper, which gives us a chance to test the migration uh, details and getting ready for bug fest that will happen shortly after that. In the rest of the slides in the deck are the plans for the coming sprints, which pretty much for everybody is trying to get their releases done, um, get bug fixes and hot fixes done. And for a couple teams, there are some new staff that have joined in various roles. And so there are some new developers and testers who are onboarding currently. And so I'm expecting at uh, the next sprint demo, we're going to see the last bit of new functionality that's being delivered in Juniper and perhaps the beginning of some of the, what's the next one, Kiwi release functionality. Um, and also perhaps some of the, the big uh, bug fixes that have been made. So that's it for demos. Are there questions or any other um, uh, topics, development issues that folks would like to raise or shall we gain a bit of time back for everyone? All right, hearing lots of nothing right now. I think we may be done. So this recording will be posted on YouTube um, uh, within the next couple of days with the link to the slides. Oh, there is one more comment in chat here. 
from Owen. Thank you very much. And I hope everybody has a great week. Everybody get back to work. There's lots to do. So we will talk again soon. And thanks very much. Thanks, <laughs> Juniper, Henry. here Take we care. come. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks, bye-bye, everybody. Thanks a lot.